Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast, episode 39. A bit of a different one this week. Um, I've actually done an interview with John Ruths, which I've just finished editing, and that's what most of this episode is going to be taken up with. Um, just to warn you, there are a lot of sound drops during the interview. A transatlantic interview over the internet is, uh, yeah, it turns out, I've got a lot, a lot of sympathy now with other podcasters who do this kind of thing. Um, but I have managed to edit it together. Um, just to warn you, there are times when the sound drops out for John, although his, his, the quality of the, his, the sound on his end was better than mine. I think I don't know if that's because my podcast provider is posted in the States. There's also one brief section where he talks about his army experience um, where he seems to slightly repeat himself. That because, that's because we had to do a pickup, um, but he expressed himself very well both times, so I left both of those in. So there might seem to be a little bit rep- repetition, but I, I think that's worthy of keeping in. But anyway, I won't gab on anymore. I'm off script here, so um, I'll just uh, get on with it. Here's the interview. Hello, John. Good morning, Neil. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> we speak We speak at last. Uh, I know we've spoken before. We've never actually spoken on the podcast, and yours is the first voice to appear on this podcast other than mine. So congratulations. <laughs> For me, I can tell you. <laughs> thank you. Um, like, as people will be able to tell from this episode, I'm not a natural interviewer, um, which is why I do a solo podcast, but I'm, I'm always willing to learn. So uh, I'm going to do my best here. I've got a list of questions and we'll, we'll see how this goes. Like I say, um, first time we've done this, I'm sure it will happen again. Well, all right. Well, I'm a new interviewee, so it's OK. I'll just ask you first, if you could just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you came to listen to the podcast. Yeah, so my name's John Roos, and I'm from uh, Colorado in the United States. Uh, I'm a member of the U.S. Armed Forces, have been for over 30 years. So I think uh, you and I are what call generational contemporaries. And <laughs> I ran across your podcast just by looking it up on my iPhone. I saw that I had this, I had some, and I, I had a podcast thing that, uh, that appeared. And, and I thought, well, let me see if I can find a podcast on Watership Down. And I did. And I think I found yours. And at that point, you were already a good few chapters inside of the book. And I can tell you, I've been a listener ever since. So, John, um, I just wonder if you could tell us um, how you actually originally came across the book Watership Down, how, how you first encountered it, how long ago that was and, and what the process was there. Well, I came across. Uh, I read it for the first time in about 1990 and I came across it for my younger brother, Jake. Jake's not only my brother, we're also very close friends and uh you know he read it and he told me all about it and i thought well i've got to try this and uh we were both familiar with it in our own different ways he saw a videotape of it in a convenience store somewhere and always wondered what it was about i had seen different people reading it as i was going middle school and high school but in 1990 well after i was in high school i finally read it yeah so i mean did you was it an immediate thing did you immediately love it or was it something that built up over time yeah in fact jake about that recently you pick it up and you read it for the first time and i really can't even tell you how many pages i read i'm pretty sure within four or five pages i decided i'm probably going to read and that's the kind of reader i am if i if a book doesn't grab me right away, I'll have a very hard time sticking with it or finishing it. Watership Down really grabbed me right away. Once you once you get going with it, it's a very hard book to put down. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, how often do you reread it out of interest? I mean, I know I, with me, it's about once a week. I average about every five years, I have been. Yeah, probably about the same five years or so. It's a book that I think about quite a bit, and I think that when I think about it enough – then every once in a while, I'll just have to pick it up and a couple of my favorite parts. But then you'll just find yourself rereading the book again. Yeah, absolutely. Now, is an awkward question because I'll come on to the film film versions in a minute. Are there any aspects of the book that you aren't so keen on? Anything you don't, you've never quite liked so much? I mean, it's a difficult question of the book that you love. But is there anything yeah, about it? Not really. I think that um, Richard Adams has a one creating pleasure. So every time he opens up an issue in the book or opens up something that you'd think of and you see these, you know, when you watch a movie or you read a book or something, you're, you're always at these loose ends. He's very, yeah. Creating a sense of closure. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'll go with that. Yeah, like I say, I mean, with the book, I mean, I have, when I get to it, I'm going to have, I have a particular chapter on not so keen on, which I will say at the time. Um, and that's, it's oddly enough, it's the Rousebury Wolf story. But I just, I do always find that it goes a bit too, for me, it, I, I, I've never quite got on with that chapter, but it's, I'm really being picky, really being picky there. I really had to find one. But um, when it comes to film versions, though, I think views get do get a little bit more varied i mean i wonder if, what, what what's your view on the film versions um ups and downs there yeah so i can tell you that i saw i, I remember when the 1978 film came out because i was about 11 or 12 when it did and i didn't go because i probably thought that yeah, this is a movie for the kids and if i had it i think i would have would have read the book way back then but seeing that well i eventually saw the 1978 film for the first time in about 1991 very soon after after i read the novel uh, yeah. my brother and i watched it together and i i really have a good feeling about that even though it diverges from the novel in a number of places and it's certainly very truncated uh it's such a good work i think that it its own sense of originality uh i never saw uh the cartoon series that later on and i did try to watch last winter i tried to watch the netflix series and i just i just um, couldn't get through it yeah there are a lot of mixed views on that i mean i'm going to try and be fair as i can to every film version and they've all got plus points but yeah i've heard a lot of criticism of the netflix version um and the Canadian TV series, like I say, at first when I watched that, I was thinking, what is that? I shouldn't stop calling it a Canadian TV series. I promised I'd just call it the TV series. Um, but, yeah, although it has plus points, it's it's for fans of the original book. That would probably provide the most problems. But, yeah, I know the Netflix version, It oddly enough, the Netflix version seems to have been quite inspired by the TV series. Um, they, the, some of the um, portrayals of Ephra, for instance, seems to come from there. Um, how far into it did you get with the Netflix? You know, I was in a time where uh, COVID uh, was a little bit more prevalent. It was before the vaccine came out. So I was working at home yeah. and I would I would just be doing some work. So I'd play that one on, on another computer. And I got pretty far into it, I think, um, probably about halfway. But as I was watching it, uh, I was just getting uh, more and more disgusted as I was wa as I would watch it. And, you know, the thing that makes the 1978 film so good is that they don't the, the characters that they do delve into. They don't really violate the integrity of those characters, yeah. uh, but they but they definitely do violate that, I believe, in the Netflix series. Absolutely agree. Totally agree. Um, yeah. I mean, I've already gone into some of that. I'm sure we, we will get on to that eventually. Um but yeah, I think there was a lot changed there. I mean, like I say, the 1978 film had to be truncated. Some of the truncation, I think, goes too far. I've, I've always said that. But yeah, they had to cut it right down, particularly in the bit of the book we're about to come on to. That is really cut out. The journey back from Ephrafa is just this easy thing that just happens. Um, the other thing is, and the major aspect I want to go into with you, because this has really influenced the way I've done the podcast, particularly the part three, is about the military aspects of the book you've talked about a lot. Now, I mean, how soon did that become of it? You've, I mean, you said you encountered the book, the film, quite late on, and you, you encountered the book when you were quite young? Yeah, so I would see people reading the book. Um, yeah. You know, when I was in middle school, it was a common thing. You know, if you're reading a book, you would just carry that mm. novel around with you throughout the yeah. day. And mm. I would ask questions about it. And I think that's really weird, a book about rabbits, kind of strange and uh, but I always I had I tended to have a lot of respect for the people that read it. So the folks that read it to me were folks of consequence and that sort of thing. Um, but I eventually read it. Uh, I guess I read it probably my first year in the army. Yeah. So I would I would see people carrying that book around and would just ask questions about it. And for the most part, people that read it, I thought were were pretty smart folks that I, I had quite a bit of respect for. Um, I eventually came upon the book uh, when I had been in the army for about a year. And we were out doing field training exercises very frequently, and that's when I would take it with me. And at some point in the book, I think when uh, the group were moving to Ephrafa and when Hazel divided everybody into three groups, that's when it hit me that 
uh, a great deal of the book, certainly any time that a group of rabbits moves, is very military and very tactical in nature. Right. Yeah. Um, I like to say I, that's really I, that aspect of the book has really come out talking to you, and especially with Afrafa, you never really thought of before about just how many, how much of it is clearly written by someone who's been in the armed forces. I mean, whether or not the, the phrases you use are the same that you would use, that clearly that way of thinking. Funny, no, just never, I never saw it before. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on was something you mentioned in the last episode uh, about the voice that Bigwig hears. Yeah, so that's a really interesting part of the book because, um, and you stated this before too, that whether or not you believe in the supernatural, you just have to kind of accept the fact that Richard Adams definitely weaves this into the novel and he starts doing it very early on with Fiverr's, you know, vision that, hey, we've got to get away from Sandalford. But yeah. the voice that Bigwig hears, um, it's really something because w- by the time he hears it, Bigwig goes to Ephrafa. He manages to get this ragtag group of people out. He, on his own initiative, decides to also take Black of R. And yeah. he's trying to get linked up with his group that he knows are out there, but he doesn't know exactly where they're at. And if there's a moment when Bigwig could use a little bit of help, that's it. He he sort of says things that where it's almost like he's speaking to El Herrera and and kind of speaking to Frith, almost like he's kind of invoking them the way that people will do in their everyday speech. But when he hears the voice, um, in my opinion, it's to me, it's either El Herrera or Frith. But yeah. because the words are your storm, Frith, Floyd Ra, use it. To yeah. me, that indicates that it's Frith because Frith is the one that controls nature and, and that sort of thing. And to me, it's just such a neat part of the book when that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's funny how there's ambiguity sometimes with who's speaking. Like, for instance, there's some ambiguity at the end in the film version with whether it's the Black Rabbit or El Herrera who comes to Hazel. I can never quite work that out, who it's meant to be. Um, and like I say, the ambiguity with whether or not it's El Herrera, who is the Messiah figure, you might say, or, or their God. It's an interesting ambiguity between the two. But yeah, as you say, Frith controls the weather. Therefore, it makes sense for it to be actually Frith talking direct. To yeah, people. and like you said with the ambiguity, it's really neat that <clears throat> that Adams doesn't feel the need to over-define everything. Yeah. He leaves, it seems like he leaves certain things open in the mind of the reader. And it's just one of those, <clears throat> one of the many things that makes the book so much more intriguing. Sometimes it's like in a good horror movie. Sometimes it's better when you don't necessarily see the monster. You're you get to let your imagination play with you a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Well, we've talked for a while now, and I'm not going to push my luck with this recording. This is going to be on the actual episode, this bit, because I'm using the technology for the first time. I'm not pushing my luck, and I don't want to I want to make sure this is all saved right. So I'm, I'm going to probably call an end to the conversation there. I'm sure we're going to do this again. First of all, um, I want to say thank you, John, very much for your time. Um, I'm sure we will record again. But once again, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for being the second voice to appear on the podcast. And uh, I'm sure I will talk to you soon. Well, thanks very much, Noel. This has been really fun for me. And uh, I hope you have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. So there we are. This is no longer a podcast of just one voice. Hopefully that will happen again many times in the future and not just with John. There are many fans of this book out there with many interesting things to say about it and I'd love to hear from you. If you like this podcast, please leave a review and tell others about it. And if you think there's anything I can do better, please let me know. Next week will be another one-off episode before we start going through through part four of the book. And the theme of that episode will be Fu Inlay or after moonrise. Mm-hmm.